On behalf of the First Baptist Church family here in Pulaski, Tennessee, thank you so much for joining us for this worship service. We think you'll pretty quickly see that we are not a bunch of spit and polish professionals. We're not the most gifted people around. As a matter of fact, we make all kinds of mistakes. We're a long way from perfect. And maybe you can relate to us in that way. And that's okay. Because our belief is that God's Son, Jesus Christ, is the only perfect person who ever lived. And Jesus took His perfection and did something amazing with it. He offered Himself as payment for our sins, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, sent the Holy Spirit and is right now preparing a place for us to be with Him. The service you're about to watch, hiccups and all, is not about us performing for God, each other, or you. This service is about a bunch of imperfect people worshiping a perfect God. We have prayed that God meets you right where you are as you enter into this service with us. And if you're ever able, we would be thrilled for you to join us live and in person. May the living God be glorified in this service, in our lives, and in yours, now and forever. And again, thank you so much for joining us. you guys had fall break last this past week did you have fun do fun things cool well I want to hear all about it in children's church today you guys share with me some things that you did okay all right well this morning I just have one quick announcement and it's about trunk or treat of course because we're all about two weeks away from trunk or treat and we still need lots of candy uh, we're a little low on candy right now so keep bringing that in uh, if we still have uh, Team 2 in the lead right now. They almost have 2,000 pieces of candy. Now, that's when I checked Friday. It could be different now, people bringing in stuff today. Um, but if we had every team, all six teams, collect about 5,000 pieces of candy, we would be all set. So you guys keep bringing that in. It sounds like a lot, but some of you guys already have close to 2,000. So it's, uh, and we still have two weeks left. So make sure you're bringing in that candy. Um, and any of you guys on Team 2, do you know? You are? Oh, so you're sitting in the lead right now. All right, now this morning I have just a few pictures that I want to show you, and I want you guys to tell me when you see them what these pictures stand for, what they symbolize when you see them. What you instantly think of when you see it, okay? All right, so the first one, what do you guys see? Statue the Statue of Liberty. You can see on that one too. The Statue of Liberty. When you see that, what does that symbolize? What do you think of when you see the Statue of Liberty? Peace. What do you think of? Freedom, yeah. You guys think of freedom when you see the Statue of Liberty? Yeah, that's what it kind of means for us. It kind of represents for us. Now, if you had never, if you weren't from the United States and you had never ever seen the Statue of Liberty before and you saw the, the statue, it probably wouldn't mean as much to you as it does to us. Because to you, it would just be a statue. But to us, it represents so much more than that. It represents freedom. All right, the next one we have, what is that? You guys see it? A ring. Now, it's not just any ring. It's a wedding ring. So you guys see mine? I have one, too. What, is, what does that symbolize, Aubrey? What? Because it loves parents. Because what? It loves other parents that got married. Oh, it shows where parents got married? Yeah, it does. Love. Love, yeah. It, it represents the relationship between a husband and a wife and them making promises to each other when they got married. Very good. And... Then the last one that I want to show you, it is not, it's not even really a picture on the screen because we didn't need one because we have one right up there. What is that up there in the baptistry? A cross. What does the cross mean to us? What does that symbolize for us? Hunter? God. Yeah, we, we think of that. We see that. We think of God. Jesus' love. Jesus' love. Yeah. Jesus' love. What else? He gave his life for us. Right. What, do you, what were you going to say? Did you forget? Oh, you do? Well, the cross for us symbolizes new, it symbolizes life. Uh, it shows where Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and then he conquered sin and death by coming back again, and through him we can have life. So that, that's a symbol of life for us, because it, it reminds us about what Christ did for us. 
And the reason why I showed you all these things, because we have lots of things that, and there are much more that we have that kind of symbolize different things that help remember, remind us of something important that's happened so that we won't lose sight of it, we won't lose focus of it. And today in Children's Church, we're talking about uh, something else that uh, was important to the Israelites that they kind of made to help them remember about a time when God provided for them a way to get to the land he promised them by crossing the Jordan River. And they made something out of stones that helped them remember uh, just keep their focus on, you know, who God is and how powerful he is and how he provided for them. So we're going to dig so much deeper into that story today and talk about um, just more about that and more about uh, the, the faith that uh, the priests even had in uh, getting them across the Jordan River. So we, you'll know all about that today after Children's Church. But right now, let's pray together. Uh, dear God, we love you so much. And um, we thank you, dear Lord, for just the ability to come here and worship you today. We thank you for... Um, just being the God that you are and for just being so perfect and just for uh, loving us perfectly. And I just pray, dear God, that as we um, come to you today as imperfect, that you just, um, you're just honored today by just the offerings that we give you in worship. And I uh, just pray that it's pleasing to you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, we're excited to have you this morning. Let's stand and let's worship together as we sing the heart of worship. song we're going to sing is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, and we're going to do verses 1, 3, and 4.
last song we're going to sing moving into our offertory this morning is going to be My Jesus, I Love Thee, hymn number 552, and we're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4 of that as well. Father, we just thank you this morning for such a beautiful fall morning. We thank you for allowing us to come to your house so freely to, to worship you and learn more about your son, Jesus. Father God, we just ask that you will speak through Brother Tony today as you prepare our hearts and our minds for what he has for us. And we just thank you for allowing us to give back part of what you've blessed us with. Father, we ask that you'll bless every tithe and every offering today. And Lord, use it for the ongoing of your kingdom. We thank you again. We ask these things in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. Moments like this for us are not unlike evening meals together as a family. There's some sense that when we gather as, as families around a table and, and sit down to eat a familiar casserole or, or something like that, that it's kind of the here we go again feeling. Um, it's it's kind of we get lulled into a sense of complacency through the normalcy of it all. But talk to someone whose child gets taken from them in an accident that week. Or talk to someone whose loved one gets called home through a heart attack or something in a week. And they go back to a moment that seems very normal at the time, but later seems precious. And I think sometimes we as God's people, on a Sunday morning, Sunday night or Wednesday night, whether it's at our at our special spot in the morning or in the evening or in our lunch break in our car or wherever it is when we go to open God's Word, it's sort of like we're sitting down at the table and we're bored before we even start eating. Look, the living God wants to speak to us this morning. This is a special time, and I'm not preaching at you. You know, I'm acknowledging with you my tendency to do exactly the same thing. This is special for us. And if we believe that there's a God who loves us and who wants to be known and is orchestrating the events of our lives and, and who's weaving the fabric of humanity together, if we believe that, which by sitting here we're sort of saying we do, most of us, 
then we need to approach these kinds of moments differently. So that we're not, as James 1.22 says, that we're not just hearers of the word, but we're doers. James 1.22. So this is kind of my prayer to, for us to start. Father, help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only who deceive ourselves. Speak to us, Lord, is kind of what we're saying. Well, we're headed toward the book of Acts, and as we have begun our little investigation into the book of Acts, what we've seen so far, we might say, in, in chapter 1, is that the church was getting prepared for action by God. In chapter 2, the Holy Spirit is sent to empower the church for that action. Chapters 3 through 5, the, the church was taking bold action because the Spirit had indwelt the church and, and the church was beginning to do some pretty remarkable things, and we'll see some more of that. Last week, or two weeks ago, the last time we heard from the book of Acts here, we, we saw sacrificial action through the disciples who became what many of us would call some deacons in chapter 6, and then Stephen, who gave his all as a sacrifice to the Lord. We saw what the Holy Spirit's movement in someone's life compelled him to do. And there are, there are many parallels in, in Stephen's little testimony there to our Lord's heart and our Lord's words even on the cross. Stephen, as he's getting stoned unfairly, says, Father, don't hold it against them. And Jesus from the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And the only way Stephen could say that, the only way that Lord Jesus could say that was because of their connection to to the Father through the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and that's really what we're seeing in the book of Acts. It's a testimony to a benevolent God who gave His Son, who powerfully resurrected Him, who, who indwelt the church by the Holy Spirit, and, and the church will begin to literally invade the world and, and spread out because in the history of Israel, God said, I want you to be a kingdom of priests to the nations. And they had gotten self-absorbed and lazy they thought that all these blessings and promises were for them. Well, that's a good thing we're not like them, huh? It's a good thing we never think this is about us and that we're just supposed to get here and hug on each other. And that's, that's the end of the story. No, look, we're here to be inspired and encouraged, some of us convicted at times, um, so that we can be conformed to the image of Christ and reach out with the love of God, that we can be a church, we can be God's people, not just... First Baptist Church, but we can be God's people who are engaging a hurting and lost world. And again, this is a precious time where the Lord is going gonna, is gonna to speak into our lives about this. So help us, Lord, not to be just hearers, but doers. We don't want to deceive ourselves. Well, we're headed for the, uh, the eighth chapter of Acts. If, you'll wanna, if you want to find that, that's page 710 in those short little pew Bibles, if you don't have one, or, or page 1011 in those larger ones, maybe up, up closer to where I am. But this week we're going to talk about, if we stick with the action kind of terminology, repentant action. Um, if we ever publish the, the, the CD set or the DVD set of these, that's probably what the, we'll call this, repentant action. But today we're, we're going to call it, um, it's, it's labeled in your bulletin there, repent and unleash God's power is kind of how we're thinking about that. So let's ramp up to this idea beginning in, in verse 1 just as, as, as a quick refresher on what we saw last time. Saul agreed with putting him, be Stephen, as we see there at the end of chapter 7, to death. On that day, a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. You remember Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So the Lord, as, as is true with many of us sometimes, is using difficulty or persecution to scatter his people and get this message out. Verse 2, devout men buried Stephen and mourned deeply over him. Now, right out of the gate, we're, we're seeing something that's, that's pretty, pretty riveting. There's a comparison being made because the Lord is saying the devout men were sorry he died. Well, who was he getting stoned by? The people that they would say were devout. And so God is flipping that around immediately, and he's saying, 
Those who really understood the truth were sorry for his death. They mourned. They grieved for him. And, and right out of the gate, he's saying, those of us who think we have it nailed, sometimes don't. Those of us who think we have it together, oftentimes don't. So he's, he's asking us, are you sure that you've got it? Even with that one little phrase, the devout men mourned deeply. And notice verse 3, Saul, however, so there's a contrast there. Saul, however, implying he didn't have it right. He wasn't one of those who were sorry. Because we just read in verse, the first part of verse 1, Saul agreed with putting him to death. Saul, however, was ravaging the church and he would enter house after house and drag off men and women and put them in prison. Have you ever thought that someone, for instance, was weak, who when they were insulted didn't return an insult or didn't fight back? Have you ever had that feeling, oh, she's just a pushover or he's just weak? Have you ever had that thought? Have you ever, you ever been in a place in, your, in your, like your religious life or your devotion where you thought people who just sort of blindly, out of habit, gave of their first fruits of their income to the church, you know, that, 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 that idea of giving those first fruits was something that, you know, is just kind of silly and outdated, you know, and unnecessary. And then later, you figure out that the person who turned the other cheek and didn't return insult for insult really understood it. Or the person who gave of those first fruits, they really understood something that maybe you at the time didn't understand. Maybe, maybe you were a little bit self-righteous in your perspective on what weakness was or what, how strength should be used or how money should be spent or what should be done. And later, just kind of to yourself maybe, you thought they were right and I was wrong. Well, that's a little bit what was going on here with Saul, who we would come to know as Paul, of course, but he hasn't really changed all that yet. But here's the picture Saul, however, here's how Warren Wiersbe describes his attitude toward Christians. Jesus of Nazareth is dead. Do you expect me to believe that a crucified nobody is the promised Messiah? According to our law, anyone who's hung on a tree is cursed. Would God take a cursed false prophet and make him the Messiah? No. His followers are preaching that Jesus is both alive and doing miracles through them. But their power comes from Satan, not from God. This is a dangerous sect, and I intend to eliminate it before it destroys our historic Jewish faith. That pretty well captures Saul's attitude. So he's ravaging the church out of self-righteousness. He's ravaging the church and acting out of his own arrogance. He's deceived. He is labeling them as being under Satan's influence when it's exactly the opposite. So can we, by the way. So can we climb up on the self-righteous hill and sit in a self-righteous chair, and we can think that we're right when all the time we're the ones that are wrong. We can be just like him. So Tony, however... That's, that's the first thing we need to get right. To be humble before the Lord, to say, Lord, I'm listening. Speak to me. Show me who I am. He wasn't. He was a picture of self-righteous, unrepentant arrogance. And in his mind, for good reason. Verse 4, so those who were scattered went on their way preaching the message of the good news. But Philip, new character here, the evangelist, went down to a city in Samaria, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the message is expanding, and proclaimed the Messiah to them. So Paul is, is 
shutting down this proclamation, and Philip, now a good guy, so to speak, is proclaiming. Verse 6, the crowds paid attention with one mind to what Philip said. As they heard and saw the signs he was performing, for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of the many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed, and the lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. There's a powerful movement of God at work through the evangelist here. There was great joy in that city. You know, we have an expression in our society, seeing is believing. Seeing is believing. Well, the Grand Canyon is breathtaking. And those, I've never been there. Those of you who have been there, you see this picture and you go, eh. That doesn't capture it. That doesn't do it justice. I'm telling you, the Grand Canyon is amazing. Seeing is believing. You've got to see it to believe it. And, well, our kids, mom, dad, my room is really clean. And we're downstairs or we're in the kitchen or we'll say, well, seeing's believing. Let's go look. Seeing is believing. Well, seeing isn't always believing. Because we see politicians shaking hands. And we see them smile at each other. The Democrats just had their, um, you know, convention and some of their debates, or not the convention, the debates. The Republicans had their debates and all that. We see them shaking hands on stage afterward, and they look like they really love each other, and they're really collegial, and, hey, we're all in this together for the greater good of the country and the party look. We see it, but do we believe it? No. No. We don't believe that. So seeing isn't always believing. And that's the case, too, in God's Word today. These people had great joy. They saw great signs and wonders. They saw firsthand that things were happening. But did they believe? Did they truly believe? They heard and saw, we, we read in verse 6. They had great joy, verse 8. But there's something different about witnessing God doing things and personally experiencing God doing things. There's a difference between in things of faith, seeing and acknowledging as true and believing for oneself. And we're going to see this through the next person that we'll meet in this, in this passage. Beginning in verse 9, a man named Simon had previously practiced sorcery in that city and astounded the Samaritan people while claiming to be somebody great. And that's really, really telling. So he's, he's practicing sorcery and he's claiming to be somebody great. In the larger history of the church, this guy is named, we call him Simon Magus, which doesn't sound like something you would want to call someone, Magus. It sounds like that's an insult. Um, but it's actually a transliteration. That's just a word that means bringing something from one language into another uh, of the Greek word magos. So we say magos, but, his, but it's magos, which has to do with this idea of sorcery or, or divination or using, using um, uh, demonic power to do things. So that's Simon Magus. That's who we're talking about here. And, and it says he claimed to be somebody great. And then in verse 10, they all paid attention to him from the least of them to the greatest, and they said, this man is called the great power of God. Wow. So here he is, claiming to be somebody great and getting all these accolades and this attention. James Denny, the Scottish preacher, said, we cannot at once and the same time show that we are clever and that Christ is wonderful. Let me read that again, especially to those of us who are in teaching and preaching ministries. We cannot at one and the same time show that we are clever and Christ is wonderful. That's compelling. What is our message to our kids? What is our message to our classes? What is our message to our employees? What is our message as pastors to the church? that we are clever, that we have things figured out, that we are wonderful? 
or that he is? Are we there to get the attention? Are we there to get the strokes? Are we there to get the accolades? Are we there to have people pat us on the back? Wherever we are, whoever it is we're talking to, so that they will tell us how smart, how godly, you know, how insightful, how clever we are. Or are we engaging in our homes, in our businesses, in the church, in our community? Are we engaging people in such a way that we want them to see who he truly is? What is our motive? What is our message? 1 Corinthians 2, who would come, become the Apostle Paul I came to you in weakness, fear, and in much trembling. My speech and proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a powerful demonstration by the Spirit, so that your faith might not be based on men's wisdom, not on what I've been saying, but on God's power. Woe be unto us if we are the message. He has to be our message. We are insufficient. We will let people down. We will frustrate people. We are weak. We are empty. We are shallow. We are prideful. He is our all in all. He has to be the message. And this guy is calling attention all to himself. General George Marshall and Presidents Truman and Reagan, are, they're all kind of quoted with saying something very similar. There's no limit to the good you can do if you don't care who gets the credit. There's no limit to the good you can do. If you don't care who gets the credit, I mean, that's a, that's a good operational principle of life. But what about us as a church? There's no limit to what we're willing to do so God can get the credit. Would that we could say that with a clear heart. And, and a, just a conviction, a deep conviction. There's nothing we won't do for God to get the credit. Nothing we're unwilling to do. But far too often we're like Simon Magus. We're doing things so we can be seen. Or we want to we wanna be in the advertising or be on the radio or do this or do that so our church can have a good reputation. Who cares what our church's reputation is if it's not connected to the person of Christ? He's the message, not our church. Our church isn't the message. Our church isn't the good news. The good news is that we're, even though we're sinners, Christ died for those sins and rose from the dead. And if we receive him by faith, the floodgates of heaven will be open to us. That's the good news. Not First Baptist Church, that brick church across from who? It blows my mind, by the way. I mean, it, it shows us how, how small we are when we think we're big. I, I'll talk to people in this town. I've, I've lived here five and a half years, thank the Lord. And I'll talk to people in this town who were born and raised here, and they'll get in a conversation, where's your church? Or, you know, you're a church, da, 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 First Baptist Church, eh. where's that? You know that brick church across from Sonic? <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 on First Street. You know, yo, yeah, yeah, that church across from Sonic. They've lived here their whole lives, and they don't know that... We're the church across from Sonic. Look, we're not, we're not as important as we think we are. Let's not confuse ourselves. We are insignificant outside of the empowering work of the Holy Spirit, outside of the grace of God. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. We are nothing. We're created in His image and we have dignity and all that. That's another message for another day. But my point is, Far too often we think too much of ourselves and too little of God. And sometimes we, like Simon, cling on to this kind of religious experience and environment of church for what we get out of it. In instead of what we're investing for the glory of God. Well, Simon, we met him. He's kind of a mess. Uh, verse 18 Chapter 8, when Simon saw the Holy Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, Philip and the apostles, and they're doing stuff, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power too, so that anyone I lay hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. 
But Peter told him, may your silver be destroyed. Actually, this is very, very strong language. There are lots of creative translations for this, uh, some of them not suitable for church. Uh, but Peter told him, may your silver be destroyed with you because you thought the gift of God could be obtained with money. He's, he's basically, um, it's, it's strong language. Uh, verse 21, you have no part or share in this matter because your heart is not right before God. By the way, he was baptized in those verses I just skipped. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Please pray to the Lord for me, Simon replied, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. Nothing that you have inferred about condemnation or judgment or, or going to hell would be true of me. Well, this guy just, it says he believed in the verses we skipped. It even says he was baptized. Now, Scripture is not 100% clear on whether or not Simon Magus's faith was legitimate. Okay, I, I spent some time, a couple of hours, studying this this week. I'm of the opinion now, hear it, it's an opinion, that he probably in context was not a believer, not a true Christian, as we would say. And, and that's not just because he gets scolded, because, I mean, he could come to faith and then have some holdover attitudes that need correcting. But, but I think weighed in the balance of all this, there are a number of reasons which lead me to believe that he wasn't a Christian. He wasn't truly saved, that, that his... his it, his profession and his baptism weren't connected to faith. And I'll give you three of the big reasons. The first, the word believe. Um, in verse 13, that's said of, of Simon, pistuo, is, is not always used of a salvific decision, uh, of a saving faith. James 2.19 says, even the demons believe, same word, and they tremble. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble. Sometimes the word believe is used for mental assent. And by the way, oftentimes in our country, most oftentimes in our country, that's the way we mean it when we say it. We're acknowledging something to be true. So message for us in this, thought for us in this, are we just, like Simon, people who acknowledge something to be true? I believe that's what happened here. I believe he gave mental assent is what it's sometimes called. Also, the word in verse 20 that's sort of the zinger here for perish is the same word that, that has to, in, in John 3.16 for um, not perishing but having eternal life. Perishing in terms of going to hell. That's basically what was being inferred here. May you and your, your request and all this silver you're talking about, may you be damned. That's what he's saying. And that word here is, is perish. It's, it's used of him. The word repent used in verse 22 is normally addressed to lost people. So when, when Peter is talking to him, he says, therefore repent of this wickedness. It, it could mean your attitude now that you're saved, but most oftentimes it means a turning from sin and self to God. So if you weigh it all in the balance, and you can't be dogmatic about it, I, I, think, I think Simon is probably not a Christian. You, some of you might want to write this verse down because it's pretty encouraging. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 says, The Lord knows those who were His. That's, that's very encouraging because sometimes our minds, we want to believe, we want to, and as much as we've understood, we've trusted Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, but, our, but our, our minds and our hearts and our emotions plague us. They chase us. They terrorize us because we can't take God at his word that he says, if you've done this, you're mine. Our, 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 we just get so stirred up about it. The Lord knows. That's encouraging. The flip side of that is also true, though. We can be like Simon Magus and, and be enamored with the activity of the church and be, be you know, captivated by the works of God. We, we can be in a room singing songs on Sunday. We can be giving our money or whatever. And to everybody else, we look just like everybody else. But the Lord knows those who are his. And on that day, he'll say, I never knew you. That's terrifying. So it's infinitely comfortable, comforting, and it's also infinitely terrifying to think that the Lord knows those who are His. 
But we can be clear on the fact whether or not we know 100% for sure or not that Simon Magus was a believer. We can be clear on who was getting the attention from his sorcery and his acts of power. He was. And this contrasts between Simon and Philip the evangelist that, that we met briefly. Simon was boasting and welcoming the acclaim for himself. Philip proclaimed Christ. Both performed miracles, but Simon was by demonic power, Philip by divine. People were amazed at Simon's magic, but they were converted to Christ by Philip's ministry. It's pretty compelling, that difference. Another example of Philip pointing people to Christ is found in the balance of chapter 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch. And I'll let you read that on your own, the longer account. But look at verse 35. Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus beginning from that scripture. He's talking about Isaiah. Here you have an official from the Ethiopian court who's in a chariot. And Philip comes up and he's reading aloud the scroll. And, and Philip tells him, verse 35, he told him the good news about Jesus beginning from that scripture. It's pretty powerful. It's, it's also kind of interesting. In verse 27, he's called a eunuch. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, and a high official of Candace, a eunuch. Um, some of you who are interested in this kind of thing. You might write down these, these verses. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 1, is, is God's law in the Old Testament about how worship was supposed to work and things like that. But in Deuteronomy 23, the law prohibited eunuchs from entering the temple. So he couldn't even go in the temple. I mean, you, you want some PG-13 or... Uh, NC-17 kind of reading, look up that verse, uh, Deuteronomy 23, verse 1. It's, it's, it's pretty strong. So it's interesting that he, he had come and he had a heart to be near God's work and his people and all this, this Ethiopian, but it, it looks like he wasn't even allowed in the temple. Another verse, however, though, is pretty interesting. Isaiah 56, verses 3 to 5, promises blessings in God's kingdom to even eunuchs. So what, what's happening here is you, hear, you see a, a guy with a heart for God who's seeking him some, on some level. He comes to worship. He might not be able to get into the, the actual temple itself, but he's, he's sort of banking on the goodness and, 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 and who God is in, in some way as we're putting this together. So he's a God-fearer, but he can't be like a Jewish convert or proselyte because he was a eunuch. He was, he was prohibited. So even in this, as, as the gospel is moving we see God bringing some of those promises to light. We see this man being converted as, as authentication that, that the gospel is making an impact in the world. The Ethiopian eunuch, in, in contrast to Simon, his, his conversion appears very genuine. He also requests to be baptized in verse 36. The Spirit's involvement is mentioned in verse 39, and in verse 39 also it says, he went on his way rejoicing. There was a change of his attitude, a change of his heart. You don't get that impression from Simon in that passage we read. So his opinion, or his opinion, his conversion looks, looks genuine. And then we meet arguably one of the greatest um, works of God in the New Testament in Saul, who we met before, this arrogant persecutor of the church. Chapter 9, verse 1, meanwhile, back to our story already in progress, Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, and he went to the high priest and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. He's, he's dead set, right? I mean, he's focused on, on righting the wrongs that these Christians are doing. Verse 3, as he traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Now notice, this is not the sun blinding him, S-U-N. This is the S-O-N sun blinding him. This is the Shekinah glory of God that is going to put him in his place. Falling to the ground, verse 4, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Kyrios, Lord, it's, it's a flexible word. It can mean sir. He could, he could be hedging his bets to say God. But he probably wasn't thinking Jesus at all by any stretch. 
Who are you, sir, Lord? My goodness, it just moves you to tears to think about what the Lord says. I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Okay, for those of us who are his children, think about this. He doesn't say, you're persecuting my children. He doesn't say, you're persecuting the church. Both of those would have been true. He doesn't say, you're persecuting mine. He says, you're persecuting me. You're persecuting me. I am so identified with my people that to mess with them is to mess with me. He loves his own so much. Last week, Taylor, in his baptism, just so powerful. Why, one of the questions, I, here, spoiler alert, one of the questions I always ask people when I'm doing baptism counseling is why do you think if John said that people should be repent and be baptized, why do you think that Jesus had to be baptized or was baptized? Is it because he needs something to repent of? No. It's that he chose to identify in that water with all of those of us who would choose to identify with him. He says, why are you persecuting me? Beloved, if, if you're a person who loves the Lord Jesus and you feel alone and you feel neglected and you feel forgotten and you feel alienated and you feel empty, hear that. If nothing else, the Lord identifies with you. That is the, 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 the tender heart of your Lord, your Savior, your Redeemer, your friend. Why are you persecuting me? Oh, how he identifies us with us is just amazing. Verse 6, but he got up, but, but get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound, but seeing no one. It's, and this is sort of like the baptism of the Lord again. It's like there was noise, but people outside just heard noise, but they couldn't kind of make it out. There are so many things we could talk about in here, but we just don't have time. Verse 8, Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could not see, or he could see nothing. Now, again, this is a physical statement. His eyes were open, but he could see nothing. But it's also supposed to remind us of his spiritual condition. Here's a guy who was walking around thinking he had it all figured out. His eyes were open, but he wasn't seeing. And the question for us is, is this our story? Are we so arrogant and prideful before God to think we have it all figured out, but we're not seeing it? We don't understand what, the, what it is, the truth of God, and what he's doing. He could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and led him to Damascus, and he was unable to see for three days and did not eat or drink. Then we meet a man named Ananias. Well, you think about getting this phone call from the Lord. Hey, Ananias, you know that guy that's been persecuting the church and killing people and dragging women and children out? So, yeah, I, gotta, I need you to go talk to him. Do, huh? Come again? You know, Lord, What? kind of thing. You know, I, I think there's a little static. You know, you're breaking up on me here, Lord. Uh, I think my, our call just dropped. Can you call me back on that? I mean, that's, that's sort of what you, what, what you, the image you get. So Ananias goes and, and talks and, and, and shares with Saul. In verse 18, at once something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. But again, this was his moment. He's been three days contemplating. It is, it is, it is me, it is I you are persecuting, Saul. I am the Lord Jesus. And scales fall off his eyes after he's talked to by Ananias. Then he got up and was baptized. So we've seen Simon Magus and his sort of false profession. We've seen the Ethiopian and his true profession. And now we see Saul and, and what he's doing in his profession and was baptized. And verse 19, after taking some food, he regained his strength. And he's kind of kind of off and running. Some immediate indications that Saul's conversion was genuine. His baptism, I just read. The people he started hanging out with. Um, look at the second part of verse 19. Saul was with the disciples in Damascus for some days. If, if you're a person who really doesn't like Christians, I mean, 
You could be irritated by some things Christians do, but I'm talking about if most of your friends aren't Christians, like your deep soulmate friends aren't Christians, you might need to think about that. Because birds of a feather and all that. And yes, we're supposed to be people who are friendly to all and love all and aren't, we're not respecters of persons, we're not partial, we're not prejudiced, we're not... Yes, that's true. But if our nearest and dearest friends are not Christians, what does that say about where the locus, the, the core of our life is? So he was hanging out with Christians. He loved Christians. Verse 20, immediately he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogue. He's going back to his people. He is the Son of God, he's saying. Well, that's pretty clear. He's proclaiming Jesus as the Son of God. So his baptism, his colleagues, his message, he's proclaiming Jesus. His skill in the Christian life continued to grow. Verse 22 Saul grew more capable and kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that this one is the Messiah. So he's proclaiming him, and, and all this training, the stuff that God had done was, was kind of bringing this to, to, the, to the fore, and, and he's, he's ministering with boldness. And we see this in, in verses 23 and following. After many days had passed, the Jews conspired to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. So they were watching the gates day and night, intending to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the wall. Now, we don't see this here. There's a, there's a, a three-year kind of gap here, actually, that happens between verse 25 and 26, where Saul goes to Arabia. Uh, Galatians chapter 1, you might write that down, verses 15 to 17. He spends three years kind of contemplating and, and sorting through all of this stuff. And then we get to verse 26. When he arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. Do tell. Um, since they did not believe he was a disciple, but Barnabas, the son of encouragement and all this. So you see... Um, what starts happening here? He's reintegrating into the community. Verse 29, he conversed and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they attempted to kill him. He was so bold. When the brothers found out, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Well, isn't that interesting? Now he's going home. Um, Saul of Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace, being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the encouragement of the Holy Spirit and increased in numbers. Amazing. What... One repentant life, what impact his life had on humanity, on you and on me. You know, on the Colorado River is the largest reservoir in the United States. The largest man-made reservoir in the United States, Lake Mead. Lake Mead in this reservoir stretches 110 miles. That, that, I mean, I'm from East Tennessee. And, I mean, Douglas Lake is, you know, a big lake to me. Uh, some of you who are maybe from, from, you know, up near the Great Lakes or something, you know, you think that's silly. But, but Lake Mead, the largest man-made reservoir in the United States, stretches 110 miles. It contains about 200 mil, about, excuse me, 2 million acre feet of water. And an acre foot, I, I didn't know what that was either. An acre foot of water means the amount of water that would stand one foot above an acre. So one foot of water over an acre, and it has two million of those. Amazing. There's enough to cover the state of Pennsylvania with a foot of water. There's enough, this reservoir will store the entire average flow of the Colorado River. If you started draining it, what normally goes down the Colorado River, it would take two years to drain all the water that would go down the Colorado from this reservoir. Why? Well, because at the end of this reservoir is the Hoover Dam. Hoover Dam was constructed between 1931 and 1936. It's 726 feet tall. No water leaves Lake Mead except through evaporation that doesn't go through this dam. No water goes through there. And when it does, it goes through these four penstocks, they call them, these four towers. This is what they look like before they let the water back into it and diverted the water. So all the water is going to go through there, through these, through these penstocks, into one of 17 turbines. That, that are buried in the dam there. These turbines produce enough power that gets put out to the power grid to produce an average of four, more than 4 billion kilowatt hours of hydroelectric power each year that serve 1.3 million people in Nevada, Arizona, and California. Let's say for just a second that Lake Mead represents all the blessings of God. Forgiveness, 
eternal life, purpose in living, the strength to get up when you're depressed, the humility to admit you're wrong, whatever. Let's say that Lake Mead represents all the blessings of God. Practically speaking, what good is all that water doing behind the dam if it never moves? Nothing. It does no good. A few water skiers, maybe, wakeboarders, whatever. But it doesn't do any real good. It doesn't produce anything but a little entertainment. What has to happen? Now, let's say that those pen stocks, those towers, represent Christ. The only way that, those, that all those blessings get transferred is through Christ, through those pen stocks. What practical benefit is Christ? Or what practical benefit are those pen stocks if the water's not moving, if those blessings aren't flowing? None. So you've got all those blessings of God. You've got the pathway for those blessings to move. But if they're shut down or turned off, nothing's happening. This is the spiritual condition that lies before us all. All the blessings of God are available. All the promises of God are ours. Jesus has paid the price for our sin, risen from the dead, and all those blessings are waiting. All that power that we need in our marriages all that power that we need to live life, to be good parents, to engage our community, is connected to the person of Christ through that flow. But something has to happen, of course, for us to experience those blessings. There, I know it's more complicated than this, but buried somewhere in that dam, there's a control station, and there are a few buttons or levers that somebody has to push to get that water moving, to let those valves open and the penstocks drain that water out so those turbines can start and that power can be made. That's repentance. For those of us who need the hope of heaven, who need that as an anchor for our soul, repentance, turning from ourselves, like Paul, turning away from our selfishness and our arrogance and our attitude and a, I can do it by myself sort of mentality to Christ is what gets the water flowing. And for those of us who are in the faith, people who do love the Lord, people who have done that, sometimes there's a lot of junk in those pen stocks. Yes, the blessings are flowing, but we've got to clean out those pathways. We've got to remove those barriers in, in our relationship with Christ so that the water can flow more freely. We too need to repent. We too need to turn so that that Holy Spirit power that we just witnessed in, in various ways can be flowing through us and through our church family as well. Repentance is for us the key to unleashing His power in our lives. So what is it for us? Maybe, maybe for the first time, we need to trust Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, to experience what we can have in Christ. Or maybe we need to clean out those pathways and get right with the Lord. Again, just like where we started, a special time, being invited to encounter the Lord. This is also a special time of invitation that we're going to give ourselves to the Lord. So if you will, I'd ask you to stand and we'll commit this time to the Lord and let you respond as you're, as you're led. God in heaven, it is so easy for us to look at people like Simon or Ananias or even Saul himself and be entertained and not be still and not be humble and Lord not admit for the first time maybe that we need Christ that we've witnessed it but seeing isn't believing Lord we need it for ourselves so maybe some, some here in this room need to confess their sin before you so that those floodgates can be open through faith in your Son, through repentance and turning from sin to turning to Him, 
So I pray for anyone in this room who needs to make that decision that right now he or she would take that step and come down and talk to Brother Rodney or Brother me during, or, or me during the invitation or Brother Wes and um, that we would have the opportunity just to lead them to a relationship with you. For those of us, Lord, who do know you and take lightly the, the payment that you made for our sin, Lord, I pray that we would be called to repentance. Repentance of a lack of faith in you, a repentance of uh, being too busy for you, a repentance of whatever known sin in our life we need to confess, Lord, so that that power from your spirit can flow through your son and, and, and make a difference through us in this world. So, Lord, we give you this time of invitation with expectancy, thanking you for what you're doing. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. He is my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. I am found, I am yours, I am loved, I'm made pure, I have life, I can breathe, I am healed, I am free, here's my heart, Lord. My heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Cause I am found, I am yours, I am loved, I'm made pure, I have life, I can breathe. I am healed, I am free, cause you are strong, you are sure, you are life, you endure, you are good, always true, you are life, breaking through. speaking all morning what is true. And uh, for me, I just have to evaluate in my own life before the Lord with humility uh, whether or not I'm willing to respond to what he's saying. And I, I trust that 
by his grace, uh, you'll respond, uh, will respond to what he's saying, and that, that his name, not ours, will be magnified.